Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here with you all today. Uh, and it just what a fabulous day it's been. Uh, just remarking on, on Lucas's presentation, you just heard Milton before me. It's like to, to come on a stage that's been so warmed up, it's a, it's a bit of a daunting task. And particularly, as I know, between uh, now and the reception, I'm sort of that thing that stands in between you and, 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 and uh, a way to relax at the end. So I'll try to keep this lively and, and have fun today um, as, as we work through uh, uh, blended learning and the opportunities it brings to students everywhere. And what does it mean for independent schools? We'll cue that up. Um, what I want to do in my talk today is start with uh, what is disruptive innovation? Because if you're like me and you read newspapers, yes, still newspapers, uh, or things on the web, you hear that term all too often, disruptive innovation, or we're going to disrupt this, we're going to disrupt that, and it's all too misinterpreted. It's misused and, and, and has sort of lost a lot of its meaning in the popular uh, imagination and press. So I want to reset the definition about what we're talking about, then talk about how disruptive innovation applies into our K-12 education system, and then talk about what's driving uh, the disruptive innovation now and the opportunities it has to lift our school systems, our schools, our classrooms to new heights to reach every single student in ways that we could never before imagine. And then talk about how it's doing that, that opportunity, and finally, how do you all as educators seize this opportunity to take this transformation potential and actually make it work for every single student in your school or your classroom. And I'm going to walk through a design process to help you think through that. Uh, to, because at the end of the day, this technology as it mer emerges and so forth, it can be used for good, it can, can be used for ill, it can be used to perpetuate what they've always had or fundamentally transform it. Its ultimate impact depends on what you and your students do with it. And it's really on you as leaders to take this and shape it to do what you know is so important for every single child. So that's, that's the arc of the talk today. Uh, and then uh, and, we'll see, and we'll see how it goes and look forward to uh, taking questions, I suppose, during the reception uh, part. So let's start with this question of what is disruptive innovation? As I said, disruptive innovation way overused. Uh, when the book Disrupting Class came out, a lot of my middle school teachers picked up a copy and sent me an email and said, aha, you've written an autobiography, I see. And so disruptive has lots of prior connotations in the English language. But what I mean by it when I use the term is a very specific type of innovation that transforms sectors that were characterized by things that were complicated, deeply centralized, and inaccessible to many, expensive, uh, and therefore were very hard for many, many people to access. And disruptive innovation is the process that transforms the world by bringing things to the world that are far simpler, more affordable, convenient, accessible, such that it can bless the lives of many, many more people. To simplify how this process works, I put a little diagram up here with concentric circles. And what I want you to imagine is that the innermost circle represents those people who have the most expertise or wealth in a given sector. And disruptive innovation is the force that takes products and services that start in those inner circles and democratizes them, decentralizes them, such that these people in outer circles with less expertise and less wealth can actually partake from these different services. Okay, So disruptive innovation is that decentralizing force that brings these services out to people in these outer rungs that we would call non-consumers of those products and services in the innermost circle. Let me tell you how it worked in the computing industry. Before the advent of computers, whenever one of us wanted to do uh, a computation or a calculation, we all existed on this outer fringe of this outer circle here, and we had what was called a slide rule and do computations and calculations on the spot whenever they came up. Now, the advent of the mainframe computer in the 1940s and 50s created the computing industry. But the mainframe computers of that era cost literally $2 million to buy, and you had to have a lot of expertise to know how to use them. And therefore, the majority of us existed in these outside circles without access to computing. Now, the disruptive innovation of the mini computer in the 1960s and 70s started to make computing relatively more accessible. Mini computers only cost a quarter million dollars. So, 
Okay, so not a lot of more people had access to them, but relatively more did. They were somewhat simpler to use, but the majority of us continued to exist in these outside circles, not having access to computing. And then in the late 1970s and 19, early 1980s, this thing came up called the personal computer. And this was a disruptive innovation that brought computing to the masses, right? It decentralized the world. No longer did you have to go to the mainframe computing center to have your computing task done for you. The computer was at, came to you on your desktop, hence why it was called the desktop computer. It was far more affordable. It only cost a couple thousand dollars. And it was far simpler. You didn't need a PhD to, to make one work. And it greatly transformed the world as we know. But there were a couple other things about the personal computer that are pretty interesting. How many people remember those early machines? Show of hands. Okay, I appreciate the honesty. Uh, the students in the room, I suspect, uh, who have presented cannot say the same. Um, those early machines, you remember how primitive those early machines were? You'd be doing like word processing or something, and every once in a while you'd have to stop and coax the stupid thing to catch up with your fingers, and you'd wait while the letters just bit by bit appeared on the screen. The basic microprocessor, the Intel 286, say, in those early mach machines, wasn't even good enough for a basic application like word processing. And this is true of every disruptive innovation. When the people in the inner circle look out at the disruption, they look at it and they say, that doesn't look all that attractive. It looks kind of primitive, not all that good for our purposes not as good as how we judge performance, and they tend to ignore it. They tend to think it's inconsequential. But what they don't realize is that technology predictably and reliably improves. So what at one point can only do simple tasks out in that outer circle, over time we'll pack in more and more functions and features such that it will be able to solve more and more complicated problems. And as it does so, people in that inner circle will start to migrate out to the outer circle, one by one, delighted with something that's far more affordable, convenient, simple, accessible, and by the way, can start to do those things that I only could use a mainframe computer for before, right? And that's how that transformation process occurs. One other note about the personal computer. The non-consumers that it first targeted were kids and hobbyists. And from their perspective, these machines did not look primitive at all because they were far better than their alternative, nothing, right? They didn't have access to mainframe and mini computers. So from their perspective, this was not a crummy product. It was a product of wonderful quality because it was way better than that alternative. Okay, we know how that world continued to change and we've seen computing continue to revolutionize and now you all have smartphones uh, in your pockets that if at any point you get bored of them, you can whip them out and become productive again because that's how this uh, power has changed us. And actually, the majority of us don't have desktop computers anymore, which is interesting to note how this process continues to play itself out. And it's continued to play itself out through a lot of different sectors. I've put up here, I should change the name of the columns, but, but the yesterday column is those organizations that in their own right were once disruptive, and the today column is more those organizations that 10, 15 years ago were disruptive. And they disrupted those organizations in the yesterday column, right? And so you can tell a story about how this played out in each field. I'll just do a couple of them. If you start at the top end there uh, with automobiles, Toyota and the Japanese automakers over the last 30, 40 years largely disrupted the Detroit automakers. Now, how did they do it? They didn't start at the high end with the high-flying Lexuses that I saw in the parking lot that, that you all drove in this morning. But the... Uh, but what they started at was the low end, right? With this crummy car called a Corona. Anyone remember a Corona or own a Cor Okay, anyone own a Corona? Before I insult you. Okay, so I'm not insulting anyone here. That's a good thing. But in the 1960s when they came out with these Coronas, these were crummy small cars. They rusted pretty quickly. They weren't all that uh, great over long, uh, long time horizons and distances. But for people that couldn't afford those big gas-guzzling cars that Detroit was shoving down everyone's throats, these were an option that they now had the access to automobiles. And Toyota got better over time. From the Corona, they went up market to the Tercel, the Corolla, the Camry, the Forerunner, the Avalon, and then the Lexus and changed the world. And to be fair to the folks in Detroit, every once in a while they'd look out at the outer circles and they'd see these buggers come in and they'd say, you know, we ought to really go out there and compete with those guys. And so they'd send down a Pinto or a Chevette. 
But when they compared the margins of pushing out one of those vehicles with the unmitigated blessing of being able to produce another Cadillac Escalator Ford Explorer, it just didn't make any sense, right? And so they'd retreat back into their inner circle, seed more ground, and by the time uh, it was very clear what had happened, it was too late, and so bankruptcy and bailouts were the uh, answer. Now, interestingly, Toyota over the last 15, 20 years has been being disruptive. Audience participation time, anyone know by whom? Call it out. Hyundai, I heard it. Yeah, Kia, the Koreans, right? Taking dead aim at them. They started the low end, though, with these crummy cars that everyone made fun of, didn't work that great. And then, bit by bit, they've gotten better and better. They own the subcompact and compact ends of the market and are increasingly taking aim at the luxury end, right? And actually, a few years ago, they started running this advertisement, Hyundai did. It said, isn't it time someone did to Lexus what Lexus did to Mercedes? Not being too shy about it anymore, are they? As they win all these quality awards. And underneath them, of course, are the Chinese and Cherry, and you can imagine how this story might play itself out. We can tell similar stories around lots of this. Now, an interesting question as we come to education, and right before we come to education, is where does disruption not apply? And I want to be clear here that disruptive innovation is not like a universal thing that applies in every which circumstance. And I just want to call out one in particular here, which is that um, in industries that haven't had an upwardly scalable technology, you don't have disruptive innovation. Let me give you an example from the world of hotels until Airbnb came out a few years ago, okay? Which was that in that inner circle would have sat like the Four Seasons, right? Expensive, luxurious. The next rung out would have been something like Marriott. In the 1950s, out came uh, Holiday Inn. And there was Motel 6, of course, right? Now, the theory of disruptive innovation when Holiday Inn came in in the 1950s would have said, okay, they came in at the low end, and we'd expect them to get better and better and better and start to take a lot of the volume out of that marketplace in those inner circles. That has not happened. And so why is that? Well, the answer is that there was no technology enabler that allowed the Holiday Inn to take that accessible, low-cost value proposition, retain it as they got better and better. And so if they wanted to get better and better, they had to actually replicate all of the cost structure of the Four Seasons, meaning they needed the high, uh, high dining restaurants, they needed all the concierges. Um, for those of you who have stayed at a Four Seasons in Hawaii, I highly recommend it because there's people that walk around with uh, little Evian bottles and they spritz you just to keep you cool. That's costly, right? Now. Now, Holiday Inn couldn't do that unless they wanted to just become the Four Seasons. So, in industries without technology enablers, you don't see that disruptive innovation force. So, I thought it would just be useful to sort of go over this criteria of really what makes a disruptive innovation, and then we'll turn to how does this play out in education. And the first thing to say is disruption is a relative phenomenon. You're always disruption relative to something else, right? It's not like it exists in a vacuum. And the first question is, is the innovation targeting people who are non-consumers or who are over-served by the existing services out there? Meaning, you're making improvements, but they're not too happy about paying for those improvements. They don't need all the functionality. The second question is, is the product or service not as good as the existing products as judged by historical measures of performance? Okay. Third, is the innovation simpler to use, more convenient, more affordable? Doesn't have to be all those things, but at least one of those things. Uh, is there a technology enabler to carry it out market, if you will, make it better? Is the technology paired with a business model innovation? And I would amend this to say learning model innovation in education. Really recognizing that technology by itself isn't actually all that interesting. It's how a technology is used. And actually what we see, I'm not going to get into it today, but all of those leaders will tend to take these new technologies that emerge and actually use them as what we call sustaining innovations, which is the, the other type of innovation from a disruptive, which is to improve what you currently do. And sustaining innovation, it turns out, is really, really important and valuable. If you're not creating sustaining innovations and getting better, that, that's not ideal. Disruption also happens to be important. It doesn't occur every so often. And it has to sit inside of a new model that allows you to do it sustainably uh, and, and in a way, so that the existing providers are actually motivated at the outset to ignore what you're doing. Just thought that'd be a useful rubric. 
particularly in, in the independent school setting, as we'll talk about micro schools in a little bit, which I think is an interesting phenomenon worth considering. Now, I mentioned that education is an interesting case with that hotel industry, because for many, many years, there was no technology enabler that enabled the disruptive innovation, or at least a new disruptive innovation here. I would argue that the last real disruptive innovation was the printing press that enabled mass education over many hundreds of years to crop up across the world. And online learning has represented the first seismic shift um, in that way uh, to, to, to creating uh, new, new models that can actually in really interesting ways. And in our book in Disrupting Class in 2008, we made this crazy prediction that by 2019, 50% of all high school courses would be delivered online in some form or fashion. And when that prediction came out, a lot of people said, Michael, Clay, Curtis, you're, you guys are absolutely crazy because there's no way that's going to happen. Schools are slow to change. We just won't see it. And then a few years ago, people came back to us and said, guys, you're totally off. We, we, we have the evidence to prove it now. It's actually happening faster than you said. So I plead the fifth on that question. I think we're going to be right, plus or minus, on either side of this prediction. And as I'll talk about, though, um, I think it misses the point. But before I go there, the point I want to make is, I think a lot of the reason that people initially said they're off on their prediction was that people were thinking of online learning as exclusively a distance phenomenon. And what's been clear from the beginning is that at least 90% of students are going to continue to learn in schools. Schools are incredibly important community hubs that do lots of jobs in students' and parents' lives, and they're absolutely critical. And so having a place to go with caring adults around you and fun to have with, uh, with kids is actually really important. And so this came rise to this notion of blended learning, online learning blending itself into brick-and-mortar schools. And so in 2010 and 11, as you just heard, we went about defining what is blended learning because it started to become this term that was used every which way at education conferences around the world. And you got these really counterproductive debates where people who were doing blended learning would get up on stage with each other and just start yelling, I'm blended learning and you're not. And the other person would say, no, I am and you're not. And it wasn't, frankly, that interesting a conversation because the real question is, okay, fine, you're doing blended learning, but what are you Right? Is it good or not? Um, so we'll get into that question in a moment, but this was just to level set the field. And the definition that we've arrived at has three parts. It's a bit technical, so I'll go through the technical part, but then I'll simplify it, as you'll see. The first part is it's got to be a formal education program in which a student is learning at least in part through online learning. And this is the important part, where they have some element of student control over the time, the place, the path, and or the pace of learning. You heard Milton use this phrase uh, in his talk, but this shift to a more student-centered agency and control was real, is, is, is really quite critical to this definition. The second part is at least in part in a supervised brick and mortar location away from home, schools with teachers. And then the third part is that the modalities along each student's learning path have to be connected in some way to form an integrated learning experience, okay? that is that in the 1980s when I was in school and a teacher would send me out of math class to do Oregon Trail for 20 minutes, that was not blended learning, right? The number of squirrels I killed had nothing to do with what I learned in math. All I mean by this is what you do online has to somehow inform what you do all vice versa, okay? Now, um, importantly, by the way, I'll, I'll just make the point, this means it's not just technology in a school means you're doing blended learning, right? There has to be that learning model shift. That model thing I was talking about is a really important part of whether it's blended learning or not. Blended learning looks lots of different ways in lots of different places. This is a confusing chart we created to try to capture this burgeoning taxonomy of different models. And at the top, you see brick and mortar schools, they meet online learning and they have a baby whose name is online learning. Excuse me, blended learning. And blended learning has lots of offspring. Okay, And so we see lots of these different model types that are popping up around the country. And I will tell you that educators on the ground, not just in the country, in the world, are now actually starting to take a lot of these models and combine them in different ways to create hybrids of that, which is really interesting to see the innovation from, from 
players and different ways to create these blended learning environments. And I thought I'd just share a couple of them with you, not all of them, but a, but a couple of them. Uh, the station rotation model is a very popular one we're seeing right now, uh, particularly in elementary schools because a lot of elementary schools have been rooted in a centers-based model for many, many, many years. Centers where students rotate among different centers of activities, right? And now in the station rotation model, one of those centers is simply online learning, right? And so in a, in a class, for example, what the, uh, some public schools are doing is they might have a class of 30 students. Small group instruction is really important. They know that. And so they divided that class of 30 into three groups, 10 students on the online program, 10 students in small group instruction with the teacher, 10 students in collaborative activities and stations with other students, and then they rotate at fixed times among these centers. And that allows the teacher to dynamically group students based on what they're trying to achieve in small group instruction, move away from tracking, but still differentiate for what different students need. And you can see what it looks like here. This is a group of students on the rug with, with the uh, teacher in small group instruction. And the uh, students are in the back there on the computer doing the online work. We can zoom in and, on what they're doing. And there's another group doing collaborative activities and projects. This is from an elementary school in Los Angeles, California. Now, Another model that we're seeing more at the high school level, um, and I think it's an interesting one for independent schools in particular to consider, is the flex model where online learning, that, that curriculum sort of becomes the foundation of the course, but then students are moving flexibly and rapidly through lots of different learning experiences uh, as needed for them in a very personalized way. So they might bounce out into a breakout room to do a project with another group of students and, 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 and a guide they might do uh, labs, they might move to that social area to work peer-to-peer uh, peer -peer with students. A lot of tutoring is going on in a lot of these environments. This is what one flex uh, in school looks like out of California uh, called Summit Public Schools. It's buzzing, and it looks like the modern workforce in many ways with that open floor design. Really empowering of students. Harder to pull off, I will tell you, because there's a lot of agency uh, for students and teachers required. Uh, but, but pretty exciting when it comes and sort of a pretty extreme form of personalization and then group work allowed. Now, the bigger question, these are just a couple of the models, but is the why should we care about this? Why should we care about online learning? And the corollary to, is, is, is sort of what's driving it across the country. And my sense is that the why we should care is fundamentally about this phrase, student-centered learning. Online and blended learning is the opportunity to real, realize student-centered learning at scale, okay? And what I define student-centered learning is actually much simpler than a lot of people define it. What I think of as student-centered learning, because I know there's lots of definitions of it, I think of it as just the right learning experience at the right time for the right student. Whether that's drilling in on something, reading something, or a project, I, I'm agnostic. It's the right experience for the right student at the right time. And I think it's combination of personalized learning with what we think of as competency-based learning. Competency-based learning meaning that students move on once they've truly mastered concepts, knowledge, skills, dispositions, a great range of things, okay? That they don't move on just based on, but that they fundamentally move on once they've truly and deeply mastered something, okay? Now, the three elements driving its adoption, one of them, not surprisingly, for a lot of teachers across the uh, country, is this pursuit of personalized learning. This is from public school districts. My sense is it looks a little different in independent schools, which is we already do a lot of personalization. We're now using this technology to double down on that personalization and do it even better. And it's an important concept because of this fact, that all students have different learning needs at different times. Some people learn relatively quickly. Some people learn much more slowly, right? And this depends upon the subject or domain often in which you're working. And the reason for these differences, and so you heard multiple intelligences from Milton earlier. Some people are huge adherence to it. Some people say, no, that doesn't make any sense. But what no one is on is that we all come into learning experiences with different working memory capacities. Literally our ability to absorb audio, visual information in active memory and manipulate it in active time. We all come in with different levels of long-term memory or background knowledge. And the reason this matters is that students will come in with prior misconceptions 
or prior understandings. And if they already understand something, they're going to grow bored of a lesson. But if they have a misconception or they haven't ever heard of the term, then as you explain something, they're going to, I mean, they're going to go off in a totally different direction unless you really target in on what that misconception is. Now, there's a huge irony in the fact that I've been lecturing around this, and, and, and that there's probably misconceptions you all bring to this as well. But that notwithstanding, this screams out for this personalized learning approach. But our schools were modeled upon factories. Even independent schools have this model in terms of time being the concept and learning being highly variable, that we still do batch up students in classrooms and then ship them out at the other end. And it creates this Swiss cheese effect, which every educator deals with, which is that I know the students I'm teaching have holes in their learning, but I don't know which students have which holes, right? And so this promise technology to be able to adjust for time, place, path, pace, and help us personalize to allow teachers to have far more time working in small groups and one-on-one -on -one with students and really help them have those magic light bulb moments. Is, is a huge opportunity. We'll talk more about it in a moment. The second thing driving it is this, is this pursuit of access and equity. In public schools, this takes the form of we can't offer lots of really core classes that are important for any number of reasons. Teachers we have available to us, budget cuts, whatever. And so this levels the playing field so we can offer a great learning experience to any student anywhere regardless of geography. In independent schools, what the survey results from uh, OESIS have shown is that the real drive here is that access to better content within courses, so a lot of open education resources in many cases, or other courses that we can't ha uh, offer. So you've heard of uh, uh, the online school for girls or, or, or um, uh, some of these academies that are up of collaborations with multiple independent schools, right, where you share courses and faculty to provide amazing learning experiences to anyone anywhere across your campuses. And this is a, a huge part of that driver. Now, the third thing that's driving it in the public school landscape is cost control. And I think of this not as like cutting budgets, but more we want to afford the experience of a tutor for every single child, but we've never been able to pay for a tutor for every single child. This allows us to extend those benefits at a cost that our society can afford. My sense for independent schools is this is not how a lot of independent schools are framing it. And the survey um, research says the same thing, that instead, independent schools are excited about this because it creates more time in the curriculum for project-based learning and collaboration opportunities. And that's an amazing and great thing. Just hold that cost control, though, idea in your mind, because I think we, we'll, we'll come back to it in a moment, because I think it's important to think about that a little bit. Now, here's the design question, which is how do we seize blended learning's potential to actually realize that promise for every single child? And um, the first part of it is to start with what we call a smart rallying cry. Do not start with technology. Do not start with the one-to-one -one iPads. Do not start with the newfangled gadget. Figure out why are we doing this. What are the goals, the problems, the opportunities that we want to solve, achieve, seize for our students? What matters to us as a schooling community? And be very deliberate and intentional about that. Some of these will be core problems. We want to provide high school teachers far more time uh, to give individual uh, feedback on writing assignments, for example. Or we want to boost academic reading results might be another. Some of these will be what I call those non-consumption problems, those disruptive opportunities. We lack specific subject matter teachers. We saw that Dalton was offering this class. We want to be able to offer it by partnering with them. This might be thinking creatively around how can we serve new students uh, who can't consume our independent school services, but that we want to reach in our communities. And we heard some of that in the second block today about how do we reach out to other communities. Now, from this, you want to set a very concrete idea of what success would look like. We call it a SMART goal, which is, and this is one example from a public school that said we wanted to raise math school performance by 10 percentage points by the end of the 2014-15 school year. Yours could be, we want to create, you know, two hours extra for teachers to actually give individual feedback for, on writing assignments. All I'm saying is make it very concrete, measurable, so that you all know what you're driving toward, and that if you're on or off path, you can tweak and tack back to what you're actually saying success is. Second stage is to organize the team around it. Um, for time's sake, I'm going to push through this a little bit. The big idea is that 
you want to get the right people um, to solve the right level of problem. All too often we see schools take problems that just an individual teacher could, could do themselves and put a huge bureaucracy on it that constrains what those innovative educators might do. The flip side is also true. Sometimes we ask a teacher to innovate without giving them all the tools and faculties, uh, facilities that they need at their disposal to do what we're trying to realize. And so bringing a team around that is really, really important. And so in the book, we, we say, you know, depending on the type of problem, starts to tell you what type of team you need to bring against it. So if you're simply flipping a classroom, that within a classroom, one teacher or department, for example, if you're moving into, a, you want to rotate uh, students out to a learning lab three times a week, for example, you're going to actually need to coordinate across the school in what we call a lightweight team. A heavyweight team would be, we actually want to rethink schedules, the use of time, the use of space, in a much more fundamental way. And so we need a heavyweight team that can actually rethink the schooling architecture. Um, and then the last one would be, um, when we want to create a new learning environment itself or even a new business model, uh, we need an autonomous team that's freed from the constraints of how the existing school works to rethink this. And this can take two forms. One would be we want to disrupt class, the classroom experience, and therefore we need a team that's totally unencumbered by the way we've always done the classroom to create this disruptive experience. And I will tell you, the disruptive models of blended learning like that flex model they're not classrooms. Like these are learning studios or something else. We need new language for it. But the other thing, and I think this is important for independent schools, is with the rise of micro schools. How many people have heard of micro schools? Not a lot. Look it up. Okay? Look it up. These are low cost private schools that are emerging, powered by online learning in blended learning settings. Acton Academy, Alt School has raised $130 million. We already have something like 10 schools open. Acton Academy, there's over 20 in the world right now. Tuition ranging $4,000 to $9,000. They're targeting people who would love the independent school experience, but for any number of reasons have been priced out of it, but don't want to go to the public school experience. Another one is you've heard about Khan Academy. The Khan Lab School has launched as another one. They've created a brick and mortar school that uses Khan Academy and tons of times for projects um, to serve a lot of the students traditional independent schools would be doing. And I will tell you that while I think disruptive innovation is not a threat to public school districts themselves, like I think they'll continue to exist, I think for some independent the rise of micro schools actually is a disruptive threat that you need to be thinking about as well. Okay? Um, from there, you've, you've chosen the problem you want to tackle, you've brought your team together to design an experience, it's time to design the student experience. And I'm, I'm going to go into a bit of a story here from our research on innovation and talk about what motivates people. Because what you really want to be thinking about is how can we create a student experience whereby those students will want to come in here ready and eager to learn every single day, but will also get our jobs done um, as the school itself. So what we've noticed is that organizations typically have a very poor understanding of what motivates people to consume things. And in our research, um, just to demonstrate the point, what we've realized is that what you really want to understand is what we call the job to be done, the fundamental driver of why someone is, is consuming it in a particular circumstance, to understand the experiences that you need to create to help someone get that job done. So let me tell you just a really silly story uh, from the 1990s about why um, people, uh, what job people hire milkshakes to do, okay? So there was this fast food company in the mid-1990s, and they wanted to improve the sale of milkshakes. What people typically do, was, which was find the average demographic that was most likely to buy uh, a milkshake, and they called them into marketing focus groups and said, how should we improve the sale? And they got very clear feedback back, and then they would make changes, and sales literally did not budge one bit. So they called a different group um, in to, in, in to uh, help them, who, who had this question of what job do people hire a milkshake to do? And so rather than ask people how to improve the milkshake, they just stood at the back of the restaurant one day for 18 hours and took copious notes of any time someone came in and bought a milkshake. What time was it? What, else, what were they wearing? What else did they buy? Were they with anyone else? Did they drink the milkshake in the restaurant or outside? On and on and on. And at the end of the day, they saw a few interesting things. One, the milkshakes, 80% of milkshakes were sold at two times during the day. 50% of them were in the 
weekly morning rush hour commute. Kind of gross, right? Let's just name it. 30% were in the late afternoon. Of the 50% group, every single person who came into the restaurant came in by themselves, bought nothing except for a milkshake. Every single one of them walked out milkshake in hand, got in their car, and drove off, slurping it down. The next day they came back, and this time they stood outside during the early morning rush hour commute hours, and as people walked out with their milkshakes and hands to their car, they would confront them. And in language that they would understand, they said, excuse me, sir, you just hired that milkshake, what job were you trying to do? And they looked at them kind of strangely, and to be fair, the people who were doing this research are kind of strange people, but it's, it wasn't me. But, um, and they said, uh, think about the last time that you were in this situation doing whatever you're doing right now. What else did you buy to help you do, you know, get done whatever you're doing? They said, you know, I think I understand what you're saying. You see, I've, this, I've got this 20 to 30 minute drive to work right now. And I'm not starving at the moment, it's 7 in the morning, but I know if I don't put something in my stomach, I'll be starving by, say, 9 o'clock. And, you know, it's been a boring commute my whole life. I'm, I'm just trying to keep myself occupied and keep myself awake in, during this early morning and keep it interesting. And so come to think of it, I hired bagels last week. But take it from me, bagels don't do the job well at all. Because they're dry and tasteless unless you live in New York City, in which case you don't drive. And uh, so to make them taste good, you got to spread cream cheese and jam on them, and you start driving with your knees, and if the cell phone rings, man, you got major problems. I hired donuts last week, but I had to lie to my wife about it because she doesn't want me eating donuts. And it wasn't a terribly believable lie because when she got in the car later that day and drove off, the steering wheel was really gummy and sticky from the donuts, and so she saw right through it. I hired bananas a couple times, but that was actually the worst of all things because those stupid bananas were gone in about 30 seconds, and I was bored for my entire 30-minute drive to work, and I was starving by, say, 9.45. But it turns out that when I come into this restaurant and buy the milkshake, it does the job just perfectly because it's so thick and viscous, it takes forever to suck up that tiny little straw. I have no idea what they put in the stupid thing, if it's healthy or not, but it turns out I don't really care because it sinks to the bottom of my stomach and easily keeps me full through the morning until about 11.30. And, you know, I've always driven with uh, one hand on the steering wheel and God had given me a second hand and I never knew what to do with it, but it turns out that there's a cup holder here and the milkshake fits in just perfectly. And so it turned out, right, that the milkshake did the morning shower commute job better than its competitors, which weren't just milkshakes from Wendy's, McDonald's, Burger King, and so forth, but all of those things, plus uh, bagels, donuts, bananas, coffee, you name it, right? And so it points to something, which is that when you understand the job, what you're competing against is actually very different than you thought it was, and how you design the experience has to be very different as well. Really briefly, in the late afternoon, it was the same demographic, age, men and women aged 35 to 49 coming in to buy the milkshakes, but now they were coming with their kids, and they hired it to feel like a good parent, and you can imagine you would need a very different sort of product or service to help you parent from one that helped you get through the morning commute. And so when we think about school, it turns out that school is not a job that students have to get done. School is something that they consume, but it's not a job that they're trying to do. I suspect educators all know this. Politicians may be a different thing, but students' jobs much more line up around these things. I want to experience success and make progress every single day of my life, meaningful progress, right? Like not just superficial success, but real rich rewards that you get endorphins for. And I want to have fun with friends. And it turns out our schools are not actually structured very well to help students get these jobs done. Because the opportunities to experience success only occur every, say, three to four weeks when there's an exam. And a lot of exams are graded such that there's a curve so that a lot of students are made to feel like failures. A lot of the opportunities to experience success and have fun with friends occur in what we call extracurricular activities, which tells you everything you need to know. Whereas in a competency-based learning system where students only move on upon mastery, they're actually experiencing success on an almost daily basis on opportunities to show their work and make progress. And by the way, in projects, same thing. 
and they're constantly having fun with friends integrated into the curriculum itself. There's another consideration for independent schools that's really important, is to think about what are parents' jobs to be done, right? Why are they hiring our schools? I won't venture guesses right now, but the point of this is that schools often do pretty poorly against these jobs compared to alternatives, which are things like I'm going to drop out and cruise around town, video games, uh, athletics, arts, you name it. There's lots of things that students can hire based on where they spend their time and where they spend their actual attention and motivation that takes away from school. Now, Scale the job in this student experience, you have to understand that jobs have three layers to them. The first is this fundamental job, functional, emotional, social dimensions of it. The next layer is the experiences uh, that you need to provide in order to get that job, job done perfectly. So the milkshake example, for example, would be, should we make the milkshake thinner, should we um, uh, make it fruitier or not, on and on and on. And then the um, question, the last question is, okay, understanding the experiences how do we have, what do we have to provide, and how do we have to knit them together to get these done correctly? So in the case of the fast food restaurant, they thought they were integrated correctly to get milkshakes out the door because they had a mixing machine, ingredients, dispenser, would mix it in the back and then produce a milkshake and off you went. But understanding the morning commute job realized they're not integrated properly at all because instead you'd want the uh, dispenser to go to the front of the line, give people a prepaid swipe card so they could dash in, gas up, and get on their way, right? Make the um, uh, milkshake even thicker, so it definitely would last them through the morning commute. You'd want to stir in tidy fruit chunks, not because it makes it healthy. Remember, they don't care about whether it's healthy or not. They wouldn't be drinking milkshakes if they were. But because every once in a while they'd be driving along and oh, swallow a piece of fruit and say, gee, that was interesting, and it would keep them going, right? And so you design it very differently, and school is much the same. And I want to give that example of some at public schools to help you think about what I mean by this. Not to illustrate it as the end-all, be-all by any means. Each community will define this differently, but just tell you, I think, one of the more thoughtful ways a school has thought through this. Some at public schools, their job is how to help every student realize lifelong success. For them, that means students have to have content knowledge, they have to build habits of success, um, have experiences outside of school that uh, imbue them with the ideas and inspiration for being productive citizens and employed. And then the last part is develop the cognitive to become lifelong learners, okay? That's their job to be done. To get students' job to be done, done, they realize that they have to provide eight different experiences. I'm going to go through this relatively quickly, but it was student agency, individual mastery, you don't move on until you experience success and actually have mastered it, access to actionable data and rapid feedback so I can do something with data, transparency in the learning goals, uh, sustained periods of quiet, solitary reading time. For them, a lot of the students that they served were many grade levels below. Didn't have opportunities to read at home. And so actually creating these opportunities in the, cal in, in the school day was really important. Meaningful work experience outside of school. Uh, mentoring experiences. And the eighth one was uh, positive group experiences. So that fun with friends job was really important, but also a critical part of of working in the, in, in the 21st century. And to um, build that, uh, first they designed individualized playlists for every single student. So every single student had different ways to master content, and each would have their unique pathway and pace through the learning material. They created 16 hours a week of what they call personalized learning time, where students are setting goals, planning on how they're realizing them, learning, showing evidence of that, and then reflecting to create a virtuous cycle. They um, created a comprehensive scope and sequence all the way through graduation against these competencies so that students coming in would know up front, what do I have to achieve to graduate? And then they created rich, transparent uh, feedback uh, with the assignments to be constantly getting feedback and improving what they were doing. And then this is a schedule that they just totally blew out of the water um, where you can see they created huge chunks of project-based learning time where students could take what they were learning in the online platform and apply it, creating a need to know them back to the knowledge. But huge opportunities in positive group experiences. And then on Fridays, they would have uh, large chunks of time devoted to mentorship with your teachers, where you were talking more about your career, life goals, passions, etc. cetera. Um, and then also um, eight weeks per year of what they call expeditions, where you got off of campus and actually worked in externships in the community 
to learn about different options. I mean, Lucas was talking about engineering earlier. I didn't know what engineering was until I was a junior in college. So really important opportunities. From there, you talk about designing the teaching experience. And the question I would ask you is, what's the best use of face-to-face -face time? And I would submit increasingly it's not a lecture, but instead uh, the opportunity for teachers to be mentors to students, facilitators of rich Socratic discussions and projects, uh, tutors in either small groups or one-on-one, -on -one, uh, evaluators of deep learning that computers could never do, and counselors for all those non-academic problems and challenges and questions our students have for us that all too often get short shrift in the discussion. From there is the technology. Okay, so we've now defined the problem, brought the team to bear on it, designed the student experience, the ideal teaching experience, and now we start to think about the content, the technology, and the facilities themselves. And really make these things in service of your design, not like we're starting with the one-to-one -one iPads, how do we force fit the design to them, right? Everything you do should be around that. And then the other question that I would encourage you all to ask, and I'm going to wrap up here on this note, which is a lot of the campuses in independent schools are often rethinking what does campus look like? Often have opportunities to rethink what school looks like, buildings themselves. A lot of places when they move to blended learning have to ex hack, if you will, existing spaces. Often you guys have the opportunity to say, what's the best use of brick and mortar space? And I, I'd encourage you to think on the traditional classroom structure increasingly to much more spaces that evoke safety and cleanliness, sure, but really are inspiring, present availability and flexibility so that we can personalize for each student's needs increasingly. And I'll just leave you with some screenshots from uh, Intrinsic Schools, which is a charter school in Chicago that created a brand new school facility uh, about a year or two ago around blended learning that is literally gorgeous and cost a fraction of what it costs to educate, uh, to build a brand new school in the traditional model with far more instructional space in the school and a far greener and facility from an environmental perspective. And you can see like they've created learning spaces and experiences that are deeply motivating and rewarding students and look a lot more like what the modern workforce actually looks like um, in really neat ways. From there, you'll actually choose the instructional model, you'll lock in on it. I showed you some of those models. Shape the culture and be very intentional about this. Independent schools have very strong cultures and that's really important to preserve that but also to build it as you move into blended learning because I will tell you that blended learning will take a school culture that is good and make it great but it will also take a bad culture and accelerate it to make it terrible. So as you're giving students more agency and ownership, be very intentional about what that culture looks like with uh, teachers and students. Um, and then I, I would just say, none of us knows exactly what this is supposed to look like. So identify the assumptions that you're making, and then as you start to implement, test and learn them, and adjust as you learn what is and isn't true along the way to creating that future. Because we're, we're entering a brave new world of what schooling and learning can look like for each and every individual. And my sense is that it will be deeply personalized, it will be deeply uh, uh, project-based at times, there will be deep opportunities to go deep into knowledge, there will be deep opportunities for collaboration, it will be blended not just in the technology sense, but in the sense of 24-7 opportunities to learn across all of these modalities. But what those mix for each student's what the, that mix for each community looks like, what that mix for each independent school looks like, will be different and indeed independent. And I think all of you are standing at a great opportunity, inspired by all that we've heard today, to invent that future and create it. And uh, I just hope that this provides a useful uh, design framework to think through those choices and opportunities you have to serve every single student well. Thank you so much for your time today. I look forward to talking more. Thank you.